pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Thank you, Hannah and the worship team. I really appreciate that. Um, good morning, CFC family. Uh, thanks for joining us both in person and virtually. Uh, as some of you know, Pastor Helicon and Joyce are in Santa Barbara this weekend where Pastor Helicon is guest preaching at his old church, um, which is why I'm the guest, guest preacher at, at our church here today. Um, so I, I recently looked back to when we started this current sermon series, looking through First and Second Samuel, and it's been almost nine months now that we've officially preached through the life of certain key individuals, right? We've preached through Samuel, we've preached through Saul, um, and then also King David. And, and the reason I thought about that is because we have talked mostly positive in this sermon series about David, right? his actions, his heart, his goodness. But that's about to change with this morning's passage, uh, which I believe really is a turning point in David's life and legacy. Uh, it is the story of King David's utter wickedness towards Bathsheba and Uriah. And to be completely honest, whenever I hear about the, all the wonderful things that you know, King David has done and King David did in obeying God, leading the nation of Israel, there's always something in the back of my head thinking, but you, you did some really bad stuff. Um, it, it is hard for me at times to separate these two things, because you cannot just focus on the positives of David, right, and ignore the absolute wicked things he did to Bathsheba, to Uriah, to the Lord. And for me, it's the same feeling, you know, that I get when I watch a documentary about some individual where you know the broader picture, right? You know more of the full story of this person. Um, and one example is a documentary Wendy and I watched during the pandemic uh, on the life of Tiger Woods, right? Uh, the first half of the documentary, it was mostly positive, right? Focused on Tiger Woods' childhood, this innocent, shy kid, uh, respectful to others. One of the people interviewed was the, um, uh, this girl he went to high school prom with, and she described him as just a, just such a sweet person, right? And her family really enjoyed having him around. He treated, you know, she treated her and he treated family with just class and warmth, and they just, they just really enjoyed being around him. Um, and, and even as Tiger Woods became more and more successful, it seemed like he had a pretty good head on his shoulders, right? He got married, um, he had a family, there was just this trustworthy aura around him. But, you know, because it's a documentary and because we have heard some of the things that have happened in Tiger Woods' life, we know the story doesn't end right there, right? And so when we're watching this, me and Wendy, we have a different perspective. We know what is coming. All this praise, all these pictures of success and inspiring others, we know it doesn't paint the entire picture, right? Um, and unfortunately, as most of you know, Tiger Woods' story does have a dark side to it. And so the second half of the documentary, it shows that he is a flawed individual that has unfortunately cheated on his wife multiple times with multiple women, right? He's threatened others for exposing certain behaviors of his. Really, the story of Tiger Woods cannot be told with both, uh, w without both the good and the bad. And I feel similarly with the story of King David, right? Because up to this point, David's character and relationship with God is an example for all of us. Right? We've highlighted David's righteousness, um, and faithfulness to God, right, in 1 Samuel 26, by not killing Saul, even when given the opportunity to, right, it was kind of laid in front of him. We've highlighted David's righteousness, or, uh, sorry, fairness, right, in 2 Samuel chapter 8, especially in verse 15, it says, David administered justice and equity to all his people. So he treated the people of Israel fairly, justly. And last week, Pastor Helicon highlighted David's kindness and goodness in 2 Samuel chapter 9, right, through his brotherhood with Jonathan, right, this deep love that he and Jonathan had. And it extended to Jonathan's son, Mephibosheth, right, who was disabled. But David took him in, right, treated him as his own, treated him as royalty. So up to this point, 
there really has not been much, right, anyone can say to criticize David, his leadership, his relationship with God, really his overall desire to walk right with the Lord until now. This morning really is a turning point in David's life as we dive into the story of David, Bathsheba, Uriah, in 2 Samuel chapter 11. And we're going to look into how this story is relevant to us and what this story says about God. And my plan this morning is to talk about these particular themes, right? The wickedness of King David, the wickedness of me and you, and the holiness and grace of God. And my primary hope is that we walk away with a deeper conviction about the darkness of sin and a deeper conviction on the beauty of God. A deeper conviction about the darkness of sin and a deeper conviction on the beauty of God. Uh, let's first pray. Um, Lord, would you, would you give me the words to preach this morning? Would you help myself and mm, the congregation really um, just humble our hearts and open our hearts to uh, what you have to say to us? We also pray for Pastor Helicon and Joyce and pray for Pastor Helicon as he preaches um, right now as well, Lord. Would you give him the words to speak um, and that those listening would really Draw close to you uh, because of your word. Uh, we thank you. We love you. Pray always in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. So, please open up your Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter 11. Um, we're going to take a look at the entire passage. Um, there are blue pew Bibles in front of you. Uh, we're following along in your Bible, in your mobile app. And... Um, the word of God reads this, 2 Samuel chapter 11. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel. And they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. It happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was, wake, as was walking on the roof of the king's house. And he saw from the roof a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful. And David sent and inquired about the woman. And one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? So David sent messengers and took her. And she came to him, and he lay with her. Now she had been purifying herself from her uncleanness. Then she returned to her house, and the woman conceived. And she sent and told David, I am pregnant. So David sent word to Joab, Send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked how Joab was doing and how the people were doing and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. And Uriah went out of the king's house and there followed him a present from the king. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and did not go down to his house. When they told David Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, have you not come from a journey? Why did you not go down to your house? Uriah said to David, The ark and Israel and Judah dwell in booths, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are ca camping in the open field. Shall I then go to my house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife? As you live and as your soul lives, I will not do this thing. Then David said to Uriah, Remain here today also, and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next, and David invited him, and he ate in his presence and drank, so that he made him drunk. And in the evening he went out to lie on his couch with the servants of his Lord, but he did not go down to his house. In the morning David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. In the letter he wrote, Set Uriah in the forefront of the hardest fighting, and then draw back from him, that he may be struck down and die. And as Joab was besieging the city, he assigned Uriah to the place where he knew there were valiant men. And the men of the city came out and fought with Joab, and some of the servants of David among the people fell. Uriah the Hittite also died. Then Joab sent and told David all the news about the fighting. And he instructed the messenger, When you have finished telling all the news about the fighting to the king, then if the king's anger rises, and if he says to you, why did you go so near to the city to fight? Did you not know that they would shoot from the wall? 
Who killed Abimelech, the son of Jerobesheth? Did not a woman cast an upper millstone on, from him, uh, on him from the wall so that he died at the bez? Why did you go so near the wall? Then you shall say, your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. So the messenger went and came and told David all that Joab had sent him to tell. The messenger said to David, the men gained an advantage over us and came out against us in the field, but we drove them back to the entrance of the gate. Then the archers shot at your servants from the wall. Some of the king's servants are dead, and your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. David said to the messenger, Thus you shall say to Joab, Do not let this matter displease you, for the sword devours now one and now another. Strengthen your attack against the city and overthrow it, and encourage him. When the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she lamented over her husband. And when the morning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. There is a lot to unpack uh, in this story. right? And as we look at the wickedness of David, there is sin upon sin upon sin. And just look at, look at all the lives that have been altered because of it. The context of this story, right, is that Israel is fighting the Ammonites, and during this specific point in the battle, David is away from his army, home in Jerusalem. And when we start, the text starts with David being introduced to Bathsheba, right? David sees Bathsheba bathing herself, and the text makes clear in verse 4 that she is purifying herself from her uncleanness. And, And this is an important detail because it signifies that Bathsheba is currently not pregnant, but instead is cleansing herself following a woman's monthly menstrual period. In the text, David is clearly attracted to and curious about Bathsheba, so he inquires to learn more about her. Right? And what he finds out is that she is the daughter of one of David's best fighters, Eliam. And he also finds out she's the wife of Uriah, who also is fighting right now for the nation of Israel. And the key point that cannot be ignored, right, is that David learns Bathsheba is a married woman. Unfortunately, instead of stopping the curiosity there, David actually sends for Bathsheba. David has sex with Bathsheba, and the result is that Bathsheba becomes pregnant. And some common questions that come up with this story are, did David rape Bathsheba? Was the sex between Bathsheba and David consensual? Now, the text does not divulge specific details answering those particular questions. But what we do know is that David and Bathsheba did not know each other before this encounter. What we do know is that David is the king. And if the king sends for you, right, you don't have much of a choice but to see what the king wants or needs. So there is no reason to think that Bathsheba was tempting David or that she was interested in David. Because the text focused primarily on David's interest in Bathsheba and not the other way around. So we're not going to speculate this morning on what happened. What we do know for certain is that David used and abused his power as king to initiate this encounter, and now the end result is Bathsheba is pregnant with David's child. What we do know for certain is that David's wickedness led him to commit adultery. And what we see next is how David responds to the sins that he has committed. At this point, really the godly thing to do is to take ownership, responsibility for David's sin, face the consequences, but David goes a completely different route. Given that Bathsheba is now pregnant, given that she's married to Uriah, David wants everyone, hoping everyone, would believe that the father of Bathsheba's child is Uriah's. And the only way you know, for this to happen is, is if Uriah also has sex with Bathsheba in a relatively soon time frame. Of course, this proves challenging because Uriah is not currently in Jerusalem, so David sends for Uriah. Right? And David plans to bring him back to Jerusalem as just kind of a friendly break from battle. So David sends for Uriah. David expresses appreciation towards Uriah. 
gives him a gift, tells him, go home, right? Wash up, relax. And what David is really hoping for is that Uriah spends time with Bathsheba and that, Dave, and that Uriah has sex with Bathsheba, who is Uriah's wife. Now, if that happens, once Bathsheba conceives, right, Uriah is likely to assume that this is Uriah's child, right? This is, this is his own child. And those who are in Uriah's family, uh, who are in Bathsheba's family, would probably believe the same. Right? Of course, Bathsheba knows the truth, but David really isn't too concerned about that, right? He's concerned more about the perception from those outside. But we see in the text, instead of spending the night with his wife, Uriah instead spends the night with all of David's servants at the door of King David's house. And Uriah explains this, right? Explains that there is no way he would feel good about himself if he were to enjoy all the benefits, all the luxuries of being back home, especially spending time with Bathsheba, right? While this battle is continuing, while his fellow soldiers, his teammates are not with their own family. We see, though, that David does not give up on this plan, right? He tries a different tactic. He tries to get Uriah drunk, hoping that in Uriah's drunken state, Uriah would not have the willpower or the mental state to be able to avoid being back home with Bathsheba. And, of course, if he's back home with Bathsheba, he's hoping that at that point, right, if Uriah's drunk, he will have sex with Bathsheba. We see the plan does not work. Uriah still stays uh, out of the king's house. And so David really is kind of out of options with Uriah, at least in Jerusalem. And we have to point out, right, here is another opportunity for David to recognize the sin ha he has committed, accept the consequences for his actions. If anything, you, you would hope that David would feel some guilt, right? Here is a fellow soldier who is so loyal to the nation of Israel. But sadly, that is not what David chose. And unfortunately, the wickedness goes to a much, much darker level. He writes a personal message to Joab, the commander of the Israelites, and specifically states that he wants Uriah to die. And to add insult to injury, Uriah is the one who actually hands this message to Joab without knowing what is in the message, basically delivering Joab his own death note. We read that Uriah did die in battle, along with other soldiers. And in the text from Joab's tone to the messenger, you know, who actually has to relay this back to King David, Joab clearly was not pleased with putting his soldiers in harm's way for really no reason whatsoever. But David isn't concerned with any of that. He's not even concerned with losing some men because the plan for Uriah to die was finally successful. David's adultery now could be hidden a little bit better, he might even come across as a compassionate individual because Bathsheba is now a widow, right? So he takes her in as his wife. Once Bathsheba's child is born, there won't be necessarily any questions asked. David and Bathsheba are now married, so having a family seems perfectly normal, right? Everyone and everything just kind of moves on. Isn't it scary how deep David's wickedness goes in this particular story? Right? We have to remember, this was someone known as a man after God's own heart. He was an example of a king that did things right in the eyes of the Lord. You know, if you've read through First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, you know that there are very, very few kings that did right in the eyes of the Lord. David is considered one of them. This is someone who we spoke so highly of throughout this sermon series so far, now, this is a man that committed adultery with a married woman, Bathsheba. Now, this is a man that committed murder by devising a plan to kill Uriah. And to be honest, you know, as wicked as it was for David to commit adultery and murder, the fact that David was completely comfortable with hiding it, with holding it in, that might be the most wicked thing of all. But nothing under the sun is hidden from the Lord. And we see in this last verse that what David had done displeased the Lord. A more literal, transla a more literal translation right, comes from the New American Standard Bible. It reads, But the thing that David had done was evil in the sight of the Lord. David 
had gone from a man after God's own heart now to a king whose actions were evil in the sight of the Lord. Leading up to this message, you know, I shared with a couple of you, especially those in my journey groups, my community groups, that I have never really been the biggest fan of David. You know, to say that David's actions are disappointing really is an understatement. Because I actually feel angry when I read this story. David uses and abuses his power to do whatever he wants, right? Sins without a care in the world. And think about what Bathsheba had to endure. Think about what ultimately happened to Uriah. He died. There's nothing about David in this particular story that is commendable. Nothing that deserves applause or recognition. Right? His actions are wicked. They are vile. They are disgusting. The synonyms go on and on and on. But here's a sad truth that I thought about a lot while preparing this message. I am much more relatable to David than I am to Jesus Christ. We, we are much more relatable to David than we are to Jesus Christ. You know, the truth is that everything within David, everything within David to sin is within us as well. If you and I believe that there is no chance, no danger, no possibility that we could fall in a disastrous way like David, we are fooling ourselves. Paul wrote in the book of Romans, chapter 3, verse 9 to 12, What then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin, as it is written. None is righteous, no, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. In James chapter 1, verse 13 to 15 reads, Let no one send, say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and when sin, and sin when it is fully grown, brings forth death. And that last verse really summarizes exactly what happened in the story of David, Bathsheba, and Uriah. Right? David was tempted by his desire for Bathsheba. That desire led to the sin of adultery. That desire led to the sin of murder. And it became fully grown and was evil in the sight of the Lord. David did not view sin with the fear that he ought to. And the reason that I believe we are just as susceptible to falling like David is because oftentimes we do not view sin with the fear that we ought to. I, I still vividly remember a youth retreat, a CFC youth retreat that I attended long ago. And Pastor Thomas Chen, who is a good friend of CFC, he, he was the retreat speaker. And he talked about the common ways that we think about sin and and the ways that we ought to think about sin when we look at how the Bible talks about sin, right? We often think of sin as like this line that we don't want to cross, right? As long as they don't cross this line, then I'm okay, right? A few examples could be cheating on your schoolwork, drinking alcohol, premarital sex, developing feelings for someone else while you're married, Right? It's, it's okay if I get some answers from friends as long as I don't copy everything, as long as teachers don't suspect anything. Right? It's pretty harmless. You know, it's okay if I drink and get a little woozy, right? as long as I don't get wasted, black out, throw up. That's a, that, that should be okay. It's okay if I you know, fool around a little bit with my significant other, right? as long as we don't actually have sex before marriage. It's okay if I flirt a little bit or spend some alone time with another person as long as I don't physically cheat on my spouse. Right? So there's this line right, that we determine. And we mark down that line as, okay, this is sin. And as long as I don't cross that line, then I am not sinning. And for one, that's not true at all. Right? You, remember, you remember Jesus said in Matthew 5, you have heard that it was said to those of old, 
you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Do you, do you see the bar that Jesus sets regarding sin? We commit murder in our heart through our anger towards others. We commit adultery in our heart through our lust towards others. So let's make perfectly clear, right, that the line we draw for ourselves is nowhere near the bar that Jesus sets regarding sin. And that was the first statement, right, that Pastor Thomas really wanted us to fully understand. And he followed up with the second statement. If we believe there is such a line that we don't want to cross, why are we trying to get as close to it as possible? Right? If you truly understand that sin leads to death, if you fully understand and grasp the darkness of sin, why would you go towards this line right, that you've created or set? Shouldn't you be running away from it as fast as you can, as far as you can, as best as you can? And when Pastor Thomas said this, right, there's like this light bulb moment that switched in my head. Right? I oftentimes make sin so much smaller, so much weaker, so much lighter than it is. I set this flimsy line, right, that gives me a lot of room for error, and yet I still pursue that line, right, trying not to cross it, making sure there is some space between me and this line. But, but what sense does that make? Right? I shouldn't be going closer and close, closer towards the line. I should be going in the other direction. Right? I should be going as far away from that line as I possibly can. King David kept going closer and closer towards this imaginary line, and then he went way, way over. You and I, we might often go closer and closer towards our imaginary line. And how many times have we gone over? In the area of sinfulness and wickedness, we are much more relatable to David than we are to Jesus. So I've spent you know, this, this, this message so far calling out David, calling out how wicked he is, calling out us, calling out how wicked we are. And it's not fun to hear, it's not fun to share, but I hope that there is some agreement right, with, what is, with what is being shared. And, and there is a reason why I've been harping on this all morning. And the reason is the hope is that the more disgusted we are with sin and the sin in us, the more attracted we are with purity, holiness, and godliness. The more we are disgusted with sin and the sin in us, the more attracted, hopefully, we would be with purity, holiness, and godliness. Hebrew chapter 4, verse 14 to 15 reads, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who, who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. And Hebrews chapter 7, verse 26 reads, For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. That is the purity of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is the holiness of God. That is the godliness of our Savior. Jesus Christ came into this world, fully God, fully human, able to fully grasp our weaknesses and our temptations, but is the only one that is without sin. You remember the passage that we looked at earlier in Romans chapter 3 where no one does good, right? Not even one. Well, further along in that chapter comes this hope, comes this reassurance. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness 
because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. All those wicked people who have sinned, such as David, such as myself, such as us, through our faith in Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven, we are justified, we are declared righteous. And there is nothing, there's nothing we have done to deserve or earn any of this, right? All of that is by the grace of God. This free gift of grace because of how much God loves us. Another example of just how gracious God is, that King David fellow. You would think that after all the unthinkable things that he did, God would want nothing to do with him. And yet... God still kept his promise that he made to David back in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 16. God told David, And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. And we know how God fulfilled his promise. Through Jesus, who was born from the family line of David. Despite David's wickedness, the evil that he committed in the eyes of the Lord, God was still faithful in his promises to David. Despite our wickedness and the evil that we commit in the eyes of the Lord, God is faithful in his promises to us. God promises that those who believe in him will not perish but have eternal life. And God will fulfill that promise because God loves us. God has always loved us. Jesus Christ died for us because God loves us. And there is nothing we can do to make God love us more, and there is nothing we can do to make God love us less. I've always, always been humbled by that statement. There is nothing we can do to make God love us more, and there is nothing we can do to make God love us less. Does this mean that we just keep on sinning? Of course not, as Apostle Paul stated, right? This should spur us on to walk right with the Lord, right? This should give us great confidence that God's promises will not waver, they will not change, they are forever, and God's love for us is forever. That is the beauty of God. And at the start of this message, I said that my primary hope is that we walk away with a deeper conviction about the darkness of sin and a deeper conviction on the beauty of God. And it's important to hold on to both of these things, right? We do not want to focus solely on the darkness of sin and forget that we are God's beloved. And we do not want to focus solely on the beauty of God and overlook or ignore the darkness of sin. A healthy relationship with God, an honest and growing relationship with God, must, must have deep convictions about both the darkness of sin and the beauty of God. I hope, I hope that we are humbled and in awe of the beauty of God, the holiness and grace of God, because we understand the darkness of sin. And I hope we strive to fight the darkness of sin because we understand the beauty of God. I want to conclude with these two Bible verses that I really hope we remind ourselves, that we remind each other on a regular basis. And these two verses are Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 to 11, and Romans chapter 5, verse 8. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 to 11 says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. In Romans chapter 5, verse 8, But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Let's wake up each morning to put, put on the armor of God. Let's wake up each morning and remember how much God loves us. Right? Every day, put on the armor of God. Run away from sin instead of running towards it. Right? We have seen what sin can do to someone like King David, someone who was actually a shining example of walking right with the Lord. 
Someone who was considered a man after God's own heart and someone that shared a really deep intimacy with God. If someone like King David, this type of person, can fall so disastrously to sin, how arrogant would I be to think that the same could not also happen to me if I were to let my guard down? Each and every day, let's put on the armor of God. And every day, remember how much God loves you. Right? We have read about the wickedness of David. We have reflected on the wickedness of ourselves. And despite those things, God keeps his promises. Despite the fact that David was an adulterer and a murderer, God fulfilled his promise to David with Jesus being born through David's family line. And despite the fact that we are sinners, Christ died for us because God loves us. And God's love for us will be forever. So each and every day, let's remember how much God loves us. Right? Let's wake up each morning, put on the armor of God, and remember how much God loves us. Let's pray. Um, Lord, I pray that we would walk away with a deeper conviction um, of the darkness of sin and a deeper conviction of your beauty, how beautiful you are, how holy and pure you are, Lord. And I pray that that would challenge us and spur us on to continue to put on the armor of God daily, to strive to walk right with you. And always, always remember, Lord, how much you love us, that your promises are true, and they, will con they are fulfilled, and they will continue to be fulfilled. Lord, would you help us as a community encourage and challenge one another and support one another and remind each other, Lord, of these truths. We love you. We thank you. I pray always in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mike, for sharing